good. All right, so if you haven't already, if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab that, get that out. Um, if you go ahead and pull up your COH app or your sermon notes, we're going to be jumping into a series that we're calling On the Journey. So everybody at all of our locations say that with me, On the Journey. Now what we've been doing is we're in week five of six of a series where we've been talking about a famous story from scripture. And it's the story of what's called the walk to Emmaus. It happened on the very first Easter Sunday where two first eyewitness followers of Jesus, two of the very first people to experience the risen Jesus from the dead, were on a walk to city, or little village, I should say, called Emmaus. And the risen Jesus comes along next to them and walks with them, but they don't realize it's him quite yet. It's a profound story. Um, if you want to catch up, go ahead and go on YouTube or on our podcast to listen to where we've been the past several weeks. Really what we're doing is it's a wonderful metaphor that describes how Jesus can walk with us and how we can walk with him through life, how we can learn from him, grow with him, become like him throughout the journey of life. There's so much meat in this. It's not just some story from the first century that we can read and learn about. It's something that has significance for you and for me and for all of us. So we're in week five of this series. So here's what I want to do. I want to talk to everybody today about recognition. Now, I don't mean necessarily like recognizing somebody, like giving them an award recognized, but literally to recognize somebody or not recognize somebody. Let me tell you three stories about recognition. First, I want to tell a story about the Queen of England. And the Queen of England, she passed away last year, and uh, so much honor has been given to her. She just lived with such grace and such dignity. Uh, I want to tell you a story one time about the queen. The queen, when uh, throughout her life, she would often go on vacation in a certain area of Scotland. And when she would go there, she would often want to um, kind of go incognito and walk around and stretch her legs. And so when she would go incognito, this is what the queen of England would look like when she would go on her walks. Now, of course, she would have her security with her. Her security guard, uh, Richard, her head of security, would, they would walk together and, you know, they would encounter just regular, normal people. One day when she was on a stroll with her coat and her scarf on, she ran into two American backpackers who were traveling throughout Europe. And, of course, because she was just such a gracious person, she struck up a conversation. She said, good morning, how are you? And they said, oh, good morning, how are you? Great, yeah. Hey, how long have you been coming here? And she said, oh... About 80 years in a row, I've been coming to this place. And these American backpackers went, wow, if you've been coming here for 80 80 years in a row and the Queen of England comes here, I bet you've met the Queen of England. (laughs) And because she was feeling a little cheeky that day, she said, oh no, I've never met her, but my friend Richard has met her a lot. So Richard, so they turn to Richard, these Americans go, what's the Queen of England like? Because Richard was a good friend of hers at this point and knew he could pull her leg. Said, what's she like? Well, she's very cantankerous, (laughs) but she has a great sense of humor. (laughs) Lo and behold, before Richard knew it, one of the Americans walked around Richard, put his armor on Richard, gave the Queen his camera and said, can you take a picture of us? (laughs) He's met the Queen. (laughs) True story, true story. That's story one. Story two about recognition. I want to show you a picture. This is a picture of my grandparents. This is David and Kit Johnston. These are my grandparents. I, otherwise, I know I call them Nana and Grandpa. Um, they're in heaven now with Jesus and with together once again. I've named two of my kids after these two. They're just some of my heroes. I get emotional just seeing this picture of them. Um, my grandfather was a career pilot in the Air Force. He retired a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force, and the Air Force brought my family line out of generational poverty. So just so grateful for that. So here's a picture of them when they were older, but here's a picture of them when they were younger. Look at this handsome couple. Look at that. There's a story from one time when uh, my grandfather had to be away on a trip. He had to fly somewhere. He had to do something. And my grandmother decided she wanted to change stuff up. She got bored. She liked to do stuff. She had a lot of energy. And so while he was gone, she decided to rearrange all the furniture in their bedroom. She also decided to go and get her hair done. And so this woman who had beautiful auburn hair decided to dye her hair platinum blonde. Mm -hmm. Now, my grandfather comes home in the middle of the night from his trip. (laughs) He walks into the house and it's dark. He's quiet. He's not trying to wake her up or wake my dad or my uncle up as little boys. He walks into the bedroom. Boom. 
room, trips over some pieces of furniture, going, what in the world is going on? He trips over some stuff, doesn't recognize where anything is, gets ready for bed, climbs in bed, and lo and behold, it's a platinum blonde in his bed next to him. The man jumps up, grabs his pants, goes, oh my gosh, I've come to the wrong home. <laughs> Tries to run out. My grandmother turns on the lights. Lo and behold, they had a conversation and a rule got created in the Johnson household that she was never allowed to change the furniture and her hair at the same time <laughs> while he was gone. <laughs> Story number three about recognition. I've had facial hair and I've had a beard uh, since I was a senior in high school, really. I mean, I could really shave when I was in middle school. I'm just that manly of a man. <laughs> and um, I decided one year when I was in college at Florida State over Christmas break, I decided to just go clean shaven. I just needed a change. Sure, why not? And so I went clean shaven. So I went back to Florida State after Christmas break and I went to church on Sunday morning at the campus ministry that I was deeply involved in. And my own best friend who was at that campus ministry did not recognize it was me for half an hour of sitting next to each other. Crazy. This is why I'm afraid to shave my beard. I'm scared my kids won't recognize me right now. I actually brought a picture of what I look like without a beard. Do you guys want to see it? Yeah, here's what I look like. I know. What can I say, you know? My wife is a very lucky woman, let me tell you. <laughs> so here's, here's what we're going to do today. Here's what we're doing today. I want to talk to you today about recognition. And in fact, the passage that we're going to look at today from the walk to Emmaus, like I talked about just a few moments ago, it's actually the passage of scripture where the two disciples on the road to Emmaus finally recognize who's been walking with them. It's when they finally recognize that it's been Jesus all along. So we're going to look at that here together today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Luke chapter 24. We're only going to read not the whole passage, just 30 through 32, those three verses. And so something that we've been doing together as a church is that if you're able, I'm going to invite you to stand here at Loxahatchee, West Palm Beach, Lake Worth. I invite you to stand too. And if you're online, maybe if you're at home somewhere and you're able to stand in your place where you could stand, why don't you stand too in your living room or wherever you may be streaming this? And we're going to stand, and this is just simply to show honor to the Word of God. And this is Luke chapter 24 again. This is the walk to Emmaus. They've already been on the road. They've already invited Jesus into the home after they've gotten to Emmaus. And this is the climactic moment of the story and why this passage made it in Scripture in the first place. Verse 30, when he, Jesus, was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? We say this now, this is the word of God for the people of God, and all of you say, thanks, thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Lord, um, my simple prayer today isn't um, about me or about this message, just for all of us in this experience together at church. We're not here to play religion. We're here to grow closer to you. Would you open our eyes, just like you opened their eyes? And would you make our hearts burn, just like you made their hearts burn? Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. All of our campuses, you may be seated. All right. So this passage, like I said, is the climax of the entire walk to Emmaus. It's the most important part of the passage. Um, it's also the most mystical, the most mysterious, the most theologically dense, and the most difficult to preach all in time for Pastor Brandon, Pastor Curtis, and Pastor Dale to be out of the rotation this week. Go get him, Trev! Right? Yeah. Um, but really, here's what uh, I think the, in my study this week that God was showing me that I want to share with all of you what he was teaching me. Um, we're going to spend a few moments the rest of our time together this morning talking about how to recognize God. How to recognize God. Now, Here's my starting premise for where we're at today. 
Um, I believe with all my heart, no matter where you are on the spiritual journey, and this goes for everybody here in Loxahatchee, at West Palm Beach, at Lake Worth, online, later on YouTube, wherever, however, I believe God is at work in your life. No matter where you are in the spiritual journey, whether you're totally disinterested in faith, maybe you're warm to the idea of faith, maybe you're exploring Christianity, maybe you got hurt by church a long time ago and you're just putting your toes back in the water now. Or maybe you've been walking with Jesus in friendship with him, being an apprentice of Jesus for decades. Wherever you are on the spiritual spectrum, I believe with all my heart that God is right now at work in your life. And he's trying to reveal himself to you because he loves you. His grace and his mercy are at work quietly now in your life, weaving in and out of all of your circumstances, working through all things, trying to reveal himself to you and reveal himself even more and more to you. That's my starting premise. Now, the key is, if God is at work in your life, no matter where you are on the spectrum, and he's trying to reveal himself to you, the key is learning how to recognize God at work in your life no matter where you are on the journey. Now, the beautiful thing about the passage today is that we are learning from two people who had God reveal reveal himself to them in a deeply profound way that we can learn from. What I want to tell you today is that what's happening in the passage is way more than, ta-da, it's Jesus, and then he disappears. There's way more that's happening there. Under the hood and underneath the layers of what's happening are multiple different ways where God is revealing himself to these people and they're learning how he did it so they learn how to recognize him later on and we can learn the same thing too. So if you're taking notes, here's the first thing that we can learn from from these two disciples in the home, in the village, after the road to Emmaus. One is that they recognized Jesus as the head of the table. They recognized Jesus as the head of the table. What in the world do I mean when we say that? Well, let's look at the verse here. So if we're gonna look at verse 30, we're just gonna go verse by verse by verse through this little section. So it says, when he, Jesus, was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and began to give it to them. Now, some scholars think, well, this is clearly Jesus doing the Lord's Supper, doing communion, he's taking bread and he's breaking it, and it's clearly that. That's actually not what's happening in this moment. Um, that happened, the th- so if this is Sunday evening at this point for dinner, Thursday evening, just four days earlier before Good Friday is when Jesus instituted the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, communion. We taught that to all the disciples. These two were not in the room with him that night. They wouldn't have known what he was doing. This is Jesus just simply having a meal with them, breaking bread, and saying grace in a normal way that he would. Here's what's fascinating about this story and about this moment in time. The two disciples, when they got to this home in Emmaus, they invited him to come into their home. They're the host, he's the guest. Well, please come inside, come have dinner with us, don't go any further, we want you here, we want you to come inside with us and share a meal with us and share the evening with us. Would you please stay? He does, and as soon as he walks in the door, the roles reverse. Jesus is no longer the guest, Jesus is the host. How many people do you have come over to your home, if you're the type of family that says grace or says a prayer before the meal, how many of you put your guest at the head of the table and say, now you say the blessing? It's a little odd. When Jesus walked in, it was almost as if they said, we sense there's something different about you. The things that you say have impact. We want to hear more from you. Would you honor us and sit at this seat of honor at the table? Would you sit at the head of the table and bless us? Who sat at the head of the table in your house growing up, if you had a table like that? Um, my, in my house, in my family, my grandfather showed you the picture of, he was often, when we had a family dinner, he would sit at the head of the table. He would say a blessing over the family and over the food. When my grandfather passed, my dad is the one who often does that now. Um, and maybe you're, in your family, your family system is different. Maybe you have a strong matriarch in your family. Maybe it was your mom or your grandma or your abuela um, who sat at the head of the table. Maybe your dog sits at the head of the table. I don't know. I don't know. But the head of the table usually is a seat that implies authority, that implies leadership, that implies culture making in one way or another. In a lot of ways, when you have somebody sit at the head of a table, in a lot of words, it's a leadership type of seat. 
When followers of Jesus talk about him, we use a word often that we say, Lord. Now, Lord sounds super religious for people who go, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. After every football game, any time a football player has, who's a person of faith says, well, before I want to talk about how I caught the touch, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they just say it over and over and over again. In our culture, it's easy to go tone deaf to this because we don't understand this word. Because we don't have lords in our culture. We don't have kings and rulers. In our culture, in our context, we are a democratic republic where we elect our leaders and pick our leaders and choose different leaders every four or eight years. We don't understand this concept. But what we can understand from the ancient world that Lord simply means leader. That's what it means. And so when followers of Jesus call him Lord, what we're trying to say is that Jesus, in a, in a certain large, huge, cosmic sense, like Jesus is Lord, we mean that he's the son of God, that he's the king of the coming kingdom, that he's the ruler of heaven and earth, but you're not really a follower of Jesus until you not only believe that he's the leader of all of those things, but you believe that he's the leader of me. When you invite him to be the head of the table at your house, in your life, in my life. See, part of the beauty of this passage is when they recognized him in a way to say, we recognize there's something different about you. We want you to be the head of our table for tonight. He revealed himself to them. Here's what I know, is that when I make Jesus the leader of my life, every part of my life gets better. Tell me if you agree with this statement, especially for those of you who might be following, who have followed Jesus for any length of time. For me, every part of my life I have ever asked Jesus to be the leader of has gotten better because he's better at leading my life than I am. Amen, right? Yeah, he absolutely is. Now, not every part has gotten easier. Some parts have gotten harder, but they've all gotten better. Because I've invited Jesus to be the leader of it. So this is part of what it means. If you want to recognize more of God in your life, you want to see him reveal himself more and more and more to you, have you considered asking Jesus to sit at the head of your table? Have you asked him to say, Lord, this seat of leadership in my life, would you come sit here? Would you come be the leader of my relationships? Would you come be the leader of my love life? Would you come be the leader of my career? Would you come be the leader of how I lead my kids? Would you come be the leader of how I choose to spend and give and save my money? Would you come be the leader to determine how I spend my time, what the priorities of our family are? Would you be the leader of all of my life? Have you asked Jesus to be the head of your table just in general? Like Jesus I want you to forgive my sin. I want you to reconcile me to God the Father. But I want you to be my leader. That's what Lord means. Have you asked him yet to be the head of your table yet? Have you asked him to be the head of every table in your life yet? And if you haven't, what are you waiting for? It's so much better. Ask Jesus to be the head of your table. So they recognized him as that. Now, Here's what's next, what's fascinating in this passage for me. They also recognized not only how Jesus, uh, his rightful place, but they recognized how the Father works. Now, check this out here. In Christianity, we believe that God is revealed to us as one God in three persons, which there's one God in three co-equal, co-eternal distinctions. There's the Father, the Son, and the who? Good job. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in this passage, it's not just Jesus at work. That's the mysterious part of all this. Check this out in verse 31. So Jesus has broken the bread. He's blessed it. He's given it to them. And it says here, then their eyes, their eyes, the two disciples, their eyes were open. What a mysterious phrase to say here. Their eyes were open. Weren't they already watching him? So which eyes were opened then? Their eyes were open, and they recognized him. Wow. If you're looking at the original Greek here, what's fascinating here is what it says, their eyes were open. It's not just speaking in past tense. It's called what's in passive voice. 
This is what it means. It means that they didn't open their eyes. It means someone else outside of them opened spiritual eyes. They didn't do it. Someone else didn't. They didn't open it. An outside force is the one who opened these eyes. And you could tell from just the entire testimony of all of Scripture, I don't have time to show you all the verses I found this week about this. The person who opened spiritual eyes is God the Father. Now, what's fascinating here, and I didn't even see this for weeks. We have been studying this passage for like two months in our teaching team, and I did not see this until I was on a walk in my backyard trying to talk to God about this, and he showed me this. So there's this word here. Go back one. Go back one. I got too excited. Go back one. Where it says, their eyes are open, and they recognized him. This word is in this passage multiple times of how they recognized God. It's at the beginning of the passage, too. Go in verse 16. Now go there. Thank you. So first, Jesus comes along, comes along, rec- uh, comes along and walks alongside of them. And it says in verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. So again, here's passive voice again. There's someone, it's God the Father, who opened their eyes to be able to realize it was Jesus who had been with them all along. And here's the deep and mysterious part of the passage. It was also God the Father who hid Jesus' obvious walking next to them. What kind of a God hides himself from people? Have you thought of that? Recognizes in their third time. It's at the very end of the passage in verse 35. And then this is talking as if the whole story has been completed and Jesus was recognized by them. So this is in the Bible because these two disciples told the story of what happened. They told the story of It must have been God the Father who closed our eyes and kept us from being able to recognize it was actually Jesus. And then it was God the Father who opened our eyes that we could actually recognize it was him. And it was him all along and we recognized him when he broke the bread. Here's what's happening. They are understanding in a deep and profound way how God the Father works in human lives to accomplish his purposes. We talked in week one. How sometimes God works in big and flashy and blow your face off awesome ways. That's a highly theological term I just shared there. (laughs) And how God will do that. But often at the exact same time and just as powerfully but in a completely different way, God works in ordinary and small and slow and hidden ways as well. Now here begs the question, why? Why does God work in hidden ways sometimes. Isn't that just frustrating? Why? It's because that's when he does his deepest work in you and in me. Is when it's hidden. Why? Well, because if God is showing you all the awesome things about himself, where every worship song you sing, you can feel all of his presence, and every time you open the Bible, it's just like it's the whole thing is highlighted, coming right to you, and every prayer you pray is answered, and you feel him in all of your singing, and your giving, and everything's going awesome, and everything is blessed, and everything is awesome. If you've seen the Lego movies, parents, little kids, okay, great. Nobody else here, just me and the young parents, okay. And everything is awesome. It's so distracting. You don't really learn a whole lot. And perhaps the funniest, one of the funniest verses in the whole Bible, I think, comes earlier in Luke 9.33. In this story here, it's called the transfiguration. So it's the same gospel. This Jesus who is hidden in chapter 24 and chapter 9 starts glowing and radiating like the sun on top of a mountain with Peter and James and John. Unbelievable. It's like melt your face off awesomeness. Jesus is glowing. And then Moses show up and Eliza shows up. It's so mysterious and mystical passage. It's unbelievable. But look at this at the end. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, if you just read it like normal, that sounds like, wow, what a reverent thing to do. Except for Luke trolls Peter in this passage. It says it here in the Bible. He did not know what he was saying. So here's how it should read. Jesus is glowing like a million watt light bulb. And Peter decides to say, oh, uh, master, oh man, we should like live here. 
do, 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 do you want me to put up a tent for the three of you? And we just live here and be roommates forever? And they're saying he didn't know what he was saying. The point of it is, if Jesus is showing up in your life in big and flashy ways, you're going to be dumbfounded and you're just going to be blessed, but you're not going to grow a whole lot. It's when God is working in your life and you don't realize it, you don't see it, you don't feel it. That's when he's doing his deepest work in you. If you go in the Old Testament, in Genesis 28, this is with Jacob. And Jacob says this, he had a dream and he was in a place where he thought God was just ever absent. And he thought to himself, surely, listen to this, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. Do you have any places in your life where you think God's not there? Are any of you going through anything, and I'm talking to you, West Palm Beach, and I'm talking to you, Lake Worth. Do you have any places in your life where you're like, I don't know what God's doing in my life. I can't see him. I can't feel him. It's like he's absent. Take heart. You want to know where God is? He's right next to you. You just can't feel it for a moment. You want to learn how to recognize God? You got to know the Father works in hiddenness sometimes. And instead of asking this question, God, where are you? You know he's right next to you. Ask this question instead. Father, open my eyes so I can see what you're doing in my life. So they recognize Jesus as the head of the table. They recognize the Father and how he works. And here's the last thing. They recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit, guys. They recognize the, the Spirit's presence. In verse 32, it says this here. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Underline that phrase. Now, they're not talking about heartburn here. They don't need Tums. They don't need Pepsi. They didn't have bad pizza. They're talking about a spiritual experience. They're talking about what God feels like. They're talking about what does it feel like when Jesus speaks with you. This is one of my favorite parts about Christianity is that it can, um, how do I say this? Christianity is not an intellectual, philosophical, moral exercise. It's an experiential faith where you can experience the God who made you, created you, loved you, and died for you. Amen. I had um, one of my best friends growing up, this guy named Mark. And we were both followers of Jesus together. And Mark in high school um, drifted away, and he got filled with a bunch of books that denied faith, that denied Jesus, and, and all this stuff. And he bought, he bought it. And books aren't bad. Books are good. He just read the wrong kind of books. And, um, and then we connected as friends again at Florida State, and he had no idea why anybody with a brain would want to follow Jesus. And so we would go to lunch every Tuesday where he could poke at my faith and go, why do you believe that again? Why do you believe that again? Well, let me tell you philosophically why you shouldn't believe that. And there was one time where after he went on for about 45 minutes of explaining something that I still had no idea what he was talking about, but I still believed in Jesus, and he didn't. At the end of our, about his, our conversation, he looked down at his meal, and I, my friend just was so vulnerable and so brave in this moment. Um, I can't believe he did this. And after this long conversation, looked down at his plate, shook his head and looked up at me, and in just a moment of total vulnerability, he looked at me and said, Trevor, what does God feel like? And I swallowed hard. I'm like, don't blow it, man. <laughs> it's like, God feels like peace. God feels like pure joy. God feels like the purest form of love you've ever experienced. God feels pure. And when you mix all those together, you know what it feels like? It feels like your heart's burning. With what St. John of the Cross said, your heart's burning with the living flame of love. That's what God feels like. So how do you recognize God? You pay attention when your heart burns because that's the Holy Spirit tapping you going, 
That's the voice of Jesus trying to talk to you. Don't ignore it. He'll tell you to not go somewhere. He'll tell you to go somewhere else. He'll tell you what to say, what not to say. He'll tell you what to do, what not to do. He'll tell you to pay attention because it's him talking to you. And it's easy to miss. I now have this practice in my life when I feel my heart begin to burn. I feel the Holy Spirit touching me to do something or say something or give something or serve someone or whatever. I pause and when I recognize it's him, I'll stop. Instead of blowing it off, I'll go, okay, Lord, I hear you. Now, I'm not doing that in the grocery store. Don't expect to look at me in public going, okay, Lord, I hear you. I'm not, I'm not a crazy person. You want to recognize more of God in your life? Don't blow off your heart burning. This is why some of you, when you're in here, especially guys, you come in here and go, I don't know why, but when I get in here, I get emotional. And I'm not, I'm not an emotional person, but the music plays or when Pastor Dale talks sometimes, I, I get emotional. I don't know why. It's because your heart's burning. It's Jesus. All right, so how do you recognize God? Have you made Jesus the head of your table and asked to be the Lord of your life? The best day to make Jesus the Lord of your life was yesterday. And the second best day is today. Why wait? Recognize how the Father works in hiddenness. If you don't know where God is, let me tell you, he's right next to you. You just can't see it right now. Take heart. Ask him to open your eyes. And pay attention to the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart. He's going to lead you into life and goodness and blessing and into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. So Lord, Lord, we thank you that you are a God that we can experience. You're a God who's not dead but alive. You're not a God who's just appearing in a book. You've risen from the dead, and you're alive, and you're working in each one of our lives here at Loxahatchee, at West Palm Beach, at Lake Worth, online. You're working in all of our lives right now, and I thank you for that. And Lord, here's my simple prayer. However you're working in our lives, I ask that you would open our eyes, reveal yourself more to us so that we could see it and cooperate with it. Make our hearts burn for Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, can we give a hand to the Lord? Can we honor him? Awesome. We're going to go ahead and hand back the service back to our campus hosts at West Palm Beach and at Lake Worth. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon. Praise God for that. And for the rest of us here now in Loxahatchee, we're going to respond with a time of singing and time of worship. This is a time where if you need to pray, if you need to navigate some things with God, maybe if you're going through some stuff and you don't know where God is in your life, now's the time to pray. Um, great. We have a couple of people exiting. That's okay. But here's what we're going to do. Let me pray one more time just for us here in Loxahatchee. Lord, we ask now as we respond in song that you would show us where you're at work in our lives so that we can respond and draw closer to you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's lean in. Hey, before we dismiss, we have prayer team here on either side. If you need prayer for anything, um, you could come tell them as much or as little as you want. They'll listen to you. They'll pray for you and just lift you up before God. So maybe some of you need to come this way before you go that way. But otherwise, would you prepare your hearts to receive this benediction? Let me pray over you the theme verse of our church. Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.